Hey everyone, welcome back. Uh, today we're gonna do a very short video on dimensional analysis. It is technically the second one, so I'm gonna call it part two. You might have seen, I already did a dimensional analysis video at the end of last year, but I did realize afterwards, and a few people asked me some questions, I didn't really cover all of the complexity of dimensional analysis, and I only really went through some of the very simple examples of it. So I figured it would be a good chance to uh, go through and do a couple more runs of it to show you the full complexity of it and how it can work. The posting frequency you might have noticed has gone down a little bit because my week is very, very busy at the moment. And obviously I have to prioritize my uh, portfolio work and my applications as well. That's taking up a huge amount of time. Um, and I've filmed a few other ones, but it's really just down to editing. I just don't quite have enough time to be editing through the week. That's a very time consuming process usually happens at night as well. And so I usually find that I'm not actually ready to start editing. I usually am still sending emails and things at midnight. And by then I really don't wanna be editing a video at the middle of the night until two o'clock in the morning or something. Um, so that's why there's a few less videos. Anyway, um, apart from that, you might notice I'm sitting in a very different position. I ended up finally getting an actual proper uh, desk chair, although I have not yet upgraded my desk. So this is not a real desk if you saw my desk video, which is why I'm kind of sitting like a child at the moment, sitting very low. Probably ergonomically, I've probably not really gotten any gains there. I'm probably screwing up my shoulders now by having my arms raised, but um, it's nice to be able to sit in an actual reclining chair. Again, I've been sitting on a stool for like seven years and my back was already bad enough. I probably should have known that I needed to upgrade a while ago. You might also notice there's this blue thing here. Um, I figured I would give it a plug actually. My student doesn't know this. One of my year 12s actually runs his own business where he makes uh, kind of gaming accessories and that kind of thing and also makes mouse pads. And he asked me in one of the shoots, do you want me to make you a custom mouse pad through my business? And I was like, that would be amazing. So at the moment, if I can show it here, only a part of it, I've basically got a simplified study custom uh, desk mat, which is amazing. And uh, I'll link his, his website below if you're interested in checking any of that stuff out. Um, it still blows my mind sometimes that someone uh, that is that young has already started a business. He's doing a very, very good job of it. And uh, yeah, he runs the whole thing. It's amazing. So um, if you want to check that out or you're in the market for a desk mat or uh, any kind of gaming accessories and stuff, you might be able to uh, get something out of it. I can never pronounce the name of the business. I'm just going to link it below. But um, he doesn't know that I'm plugging this either. So I'll surprise him when he sees the video. I'll link him to it. Anyway, um, let's get into the dimensional analysis. Okay, so our goal with this video is to carry on from what we did in the first one. But in the first one, I only did simple examples with a single fraction that was equal to a variable. And then we just rearranged and solved the dimensions for the missing variable. Uh, in this one, what I wanted to do is look at what to do when you've got two terms that are actually being added or subtracted from each other, as well as when you've got combinations of terms in brackets that are being multiplied, effectively just more complex formula structure and how to still apply dimensional analysis to it. What we're also going to do is a bit of an upgrade from the last one. I'm going to color code my working. So if I'm working using just a standard formula, using the notation for those and the letters that represent those variables, it'll be in blue. I'm gonna be using red if I'm already putting in one of the four dimensions. Although looking at that now, let's actually change that to pink uh, because I've got pink dimensions on the notes. So let's use units if I'm in red and we're gonna do pink if we're in dimensions. And that is the goal of each of the questions. So let's dive straight into it. The first example here, I'll point out, these formulas are completely made up by me. So if you were to try and find them on the internet, you will not find them. Uh, I've tried to make them roughly match as much as possible in terms of dimensions and units, so it mathematically makes sense. Uh, but at, if you were to look for them, you, you won't find them. So don't use these in your study notes or anything. This is just to prove the mathematical application of dimensional analysis. All right, so if we start with the formula, let's start in blue then. When we're adding two terms like k over v and two uh, alpha, and we can see all of the units are given here as to what they represent, although k is missing and our job is to work out the dimensions of that. When we're adding two terms, uh, we can assume that they're of the same dimensions and also of the same or equivalent units. And this is because it would be illogical to add two numbers that don't have the same dimensions. There's lots of different ways to think about this. So for example, you can't add volume to area. Uh, because they have ones in uh, three dimensions, ones in two dimensions. You can't add two uh, units that are not equivalent. So you can't add, say, three seconds to five degrees Celsius. You can't say eight because what would the units be? It doesn't make any sense at all. 
When you're multiplying and dividing, you can. That's a little bit different. So here, when we're adding k over v and 2 alpha, what we can do is we can assume that in terms of their dimensions, they must be equal. So k over v, I'm just going to make this kind of loose formula. k over v must be equal to alpha, uh, 2 alpha. Now, the other thing is really uh, constants like 2, they don't even have dimensions. So we're just going to knock that out immediately. And already we've created a pretty simple formula here. So then the next job is to start filling in our uh, dimensions. So for k, we don't know what its dimensions are. I'll just leave it as k for the moment. And then for volume, this is going to be length by width by height. So that is length cubed. We already know its full dimensions. With alpha, it's a little bit trickier. We have to go to the units to see what we actually have to do with it. So the units at the moment are pascals per meter. And then we have to deviate out to some formulas that usually come from physics. So pascals is a unit of pressure. And we know, we'll just go out here, pressure is force over area. Force is the same as mass times acceleration. Uh, and I don't know why I wrote M. <laughs> so force over area. Then force is mass times acceleration. Uh, area is length times width, so length squared. So we actually know its dimensions already. So we're kind of teasing out the bits and pieces. Then uh, mass is actually also a dimension, so I can turn that into capital M. And acceleration, we know that's measured in meters per square second, which in terms of dimensions, meters is a measure of length, seconds is a measure of time, so length per time squared. So if we clean all of that up, we end up with mass times length per time squared over length squared, which simplifies using index laws down to mass times uh, length to the negative one, t to the negative two. This is, this is uh, just the, the pressure part. Now, when it comes to meters over here, this is another unit of length. So we put length in, and now we're gonna get mass uh, per, where are we, length, and then we're going to go length to the negative 2 and t to the negative 2, like that. Okay, so now we can put that over here, so therefore k over l cubed is equal to m l to the negative uh, 2, t to the negative 2, like this, and now we're on the home stretch, now we can just solve for k and it should reveal the dimensions. So if we then multiply the l cubed up, we're going to get m L negative 2 plus 3, so that'll give us to the power of 1, MLT to the negative 2. Alright, and so then the next part, now we get a little bit more added to the formula. So it's the same formula here, uh, except now we're multiplying it by a second bracket, and now it's going to be equal to energy when you multiply those two. So our job now is to work out the dimensions of Z in this formula, where we've got a few other variables. Q is going to be charging coulombs, Z is going to be a constant that we're trying to work out, T is time in seconds, and E is energy in joules. So again, we don't really need to look at the entire formula. We can use that same strategy knowing that the dimensions of Q must be the same as the dimensions of Z times time because they're being added or subtracted. So in terms of Q, we can use a different formula. Q is equal to IT because obviously Q is not a standard dimension and Z times T. And we can actually evaluate now or simplify, I should say. We can cancel out the T's and we get current must be equal to Z. And then we can just dump in the dimensions of current, which was A. That's a standard dimension. And so therefore, Z is in the dimensions A. That one's relatively straightforward. Question three then says, what is current actually equivalent to though? So this is a much, much trickier one. And obviously it's not multi-choice. I wanted to just focus on the skill itself. So you can see that you can replicate this and do it with lots of different formulas. You don't need to be given specifically a dimensional analysis question in order to practice dimensional analysis. Okay, and then with question three, uh, we're going to work out what is current equivalent to. So even though we've already worked out that Z has the same dimensions as current, where current is A, we can think about this question in another way. So if we're multiplying two brackets together to give the right-hand side, so K over V, we'll just write it out again, uh, plus 2 alpha, and then multiplying that by Q minus ZT is equal to E. What that also means is that the dimensions of the left-hand side must be the same dimensions as the right hand side and we can get the dimensions by multiplying the dimensions of these two components here so we already got the dimensions of alpha in the process so excuse my typo over here uh, alpha was this here this is the dimensions of that first bracket so ml to the negative 2 
t to the negative 2. So we can write that down. So that's ml to the negative 2, t to the negative 2. We can then multiply that by the dimensions of the second bracket. And we can get that either from q or from zt. So q was i times t and i was current. So it's a times t. The other way you could do it is you could get it from this term. We know that it's got the same dimensions as well. So z times t. Remember z was a. So there's a times t. And it's equal to the dimensions of energy. Now this is where we have to you know, detour two formulas again. Energy is work energy, which is force times displacement. And force is mass times acceleration. And displacement is length. So we'll go with that. And then from there, if we now solve for A effectively, we need to get mass times acceleration. We did that before. That was mass times length per time squared. So t to the negative 2 times that length on the end there for the displacement. It's a t and then ml negative 2 t to the negative 2. Now, at this point, there's lots of different ways you could do it in terms of the maths. Um, I like to bundle everything up first. So in this case, I'm going to go with, let's see, I can actually cancel some stuff off. I can cancel off the t to the negative 2 off both sides. And then I've got ml to the negative 2 a times t is equal to ml squared. So then from there, the masses can also cancel. I can see that now. And my goal is just to divide everything away from the a. So if I divide the l to the negative 2, I'll get l to the 4. And then if I divide the t across, I get t to the negative 1. So these are the dimensions of a, which is current. And therefore, even though the dimensions of current are just a, the, the foundational dimension, that is equivalent to the dimensions l to the power of 4 per time. Now, again, that is not actually true. Uh, current is not actually equivalent to this. This is just what the formula is saying, but remember I've made this formula up. So what that also means is that L to the power of four T to the negative one is equivalent to the dimensions of Z as well, because Z is equal to the dimensions of A. So this is really all you have to do when you're doing dimensional analysis is you're basically trying to use formulas to convert into the standard dimensions. Um, and then you're rearranging to solve for the missing variable and it'll reveal what its dimensions must be. The trick that we've added in today is that I didn't have in my first video is that when you're adding and subtracting terms, the assumption is that they must have the same dimensions as well. As long as you've got that, then you should be able to get through now every different type of dimensional analysis question. Let me know if you found this easy. Let me know if you found it difficult and uh, I will see you guys in the next one. Bye.